Welcome back, everybody. My name's Julie Ballantyne, and I'm really pleased to be here for this session. And I'd just like to welcome those of you who have joined us. I know some of you um, joined us just after the first session, and we've certainly got some new people online. So welcome to you if you're sitting online. Um, welcome to the second day of SIM. Yesterday was really a uh, well, it was truly inspiring. I think we would all agree um, to where we were welcomed to this space and where we had some really rich and um, exciting discussions about what we're all about, the social impact of music making. And this morning we had an invitation from Yungambe, sorry, Candice, I always get it wrong, uh, and a sharing of the stories and practice by the Singing Indigenous Languages Collective. Such a beautiful introduction to what we hope we know is going to be a wonderful session, um, which focuses on higher music education and social change. And all of our presenters for this next session are on are on a line, so they've pre-recorded their stuff, but we still they are online at the moment. So welcome all of you. And um, without further ado, I would like to introduce to you our first speaker, Eric Booth from the USA on aiming at action research. Welcome. Hi, friends. Eric Booth here. I wish I were with you at this symposium in Brisbane, only one of the most livable cities in the world. As many of you know, I am not a researcher. I am an active practitioner and advocate for teaching artistry with multiple projects. But this one reports on action research by teaching artists in the Academy for Impact Through Music. This short presentation intro introduces one part of the work of AIM, Academy for Impact Through Music, which is fundi funded by the Hilti Foundation. AIM was founded over four years ago to address the golden opportunity but incomplete success of the field of music for social impact. AIM does not address El Sistema program in Venezuela, but through observation and study, we recognized a consistent pattern in many programs on four continents. And that pattern, after a honeymoon period of excitement and progress, both in musical and social advancement, most programs began to plateau in impact. While there are many contributing uh, you know, reasons for this phenomenon, we determined that teaching pedagogy and a lack of program support for continual improvement was a key cause, and that was one we could address directly. Our analysis convinced us that trying to teach conservatoire trained musicians all the basics of teach of effective teaching was not going to create a successful intervention without a full residential training program. So we committed our intervention to a 15 month fellowship, the Firebird Fellowship, with about one month of in person residency and many months of experimentation in their home program with regular online meetings, frequent one on one coaching to guide their experimentation and accurate self assessment. We seek to teach them how to surface and challenge the assumptions they carry about teaching and learning from their own musical training, and then to learn to to guide their own continual development by action research experimentation with new teaching artist practices that aim toward consistent goals. And over time, develop new teaching approaches and new habits of mind. We work with about 40 to 50 fellows a year from eight to 10 partner programs in South and North America, Europe, and Africa as is necessary for coherent uh, advancement, we've established a constellation of five consistent goals that the experimentation targets. We call these pillars and we commit to them fully. Let me screen share what those pillars look like. All right. So here are the five pillars. None of these should be surprising. Up, you know, holistic development, intrinsic motivation, 
artistry without limits, optimal agency, and building community. Stress testing this set of goals with practitioners over years has proven that they are satisfying, productive, and inspiring as a consistent constellation to aim for. This irreducible set of goals provides coherent direction for teachers and programs, and in fact, our own practice in AIM. The pillars are abstract, of course. So we added to each one of these three aspects that our fellows target in their experimentation. So each of the five pillars, you can see three more specific aspects that the fellows use to target their experimentation plans. And to further support uh, experimentation, we provide many specific practices the fellows can try that align with the pillars and aspects. And this is a resource of over 50 micro strategies they can try that align well with those aspects and pillars. Not only that, we provide a rubric of descriptors of what teaching that addresses the pillars actually looks like as it gets stronger. The rubric can provide a wake-up call. We often have firebirds who are senior teachers with lots of experience and self-assurance, and then they discover they actually rate rather low in effectiveness of teaching to the goals of the pillars. Accurate self-assessment with a coach helping is essential to ongoing improvement. Now, here's the key point. Our fellows learn their way forward through action research. Here's a basic setup of what our action research looks like. They identify areas in their teaching that are weak in achieving outcomes for their students aligned with the pillars and aspects, and they design a series of action research experiments to try out new ideas. We introduce an action research protocol early in their fellowship and guide their practice with it repeatedly until they're using it in cycles of about six weeks through the five final five months of their fellowship. So as you can see, there's a setup where they identify a focal challenge, something they want to achieve for their students that align with the pillars. They develop a hypothesis, so often we call it a hunch about what they might try that might move the outcomes in the right direction. They design experiments that they repeat over a term regularly over, let's say, six weeks. Then the biggest challenge is collecting documentation from that will be eloquent about the impact. They then analyze that documentation. It's not based on opinions or how they thought it went. It's actually the conclusions come from the data. They come to a conclusion which invariably sparks a next step in their experimentation. Uh, this is what their program looks, this is what they fill out online. Here's an example from one of our students. They fill out a form regularly. It's got pretty much the same segments that I just described to you. Here's their which experiments they're undertaking. Here's the documentation, what they're going to look for, what they're going to collect. If this helps them think about how they're going to collect it, the tools they're going to use. This is where they start their analysis. Uh, and uh, before I get to uh, this, uh, let me remind you, they get a one-on-one -on -one coach throughout. We found that the step that is the most challenging for them is developing documentation that is simple and provides eloquent evidence. And the rigor of addressing this challenge also provides the greatest learning for most of them. We find they begin to internalize the steps of the protocol after several rounds, and most continue to use action research experimentation in a less formalized way after they graduate. Uh, we seem to be achieving our goal of inspiring music for social impact teachers to commit to continual improvement through experimentation in ways that are better to achieve both musical and social outcomes for their students. 
And this slide shows uh, one, one of our alums was so inspired by this work that he gathered a working group through, the, through ITAC, the International Teaching Artist Collaborative, which I founded in 2012, now has over 4,000 members. And this working group pulled together an action research handbook for teaching artists so the teaching artists everywhere could use action research pro protocols to build advocacy and effectiveness in their teaching. Let me stop a screen share just to finish up and put a couple of resources in the chat. So that is how we use action research in AIM. That's how it's spreading across the field. And the power of it is we found it really gives a way for teaching artists to guide and drive their own improvement, continual improvement. And we believe it belongs for teaching artists, works for teaching artists in AIM and can work for teaching artists everywhere. Thank you. Thank you, Eric, and thank you for um, walking us through that incredible resource. And lastly, in this session, we're going to hear from Rijan Harda and Eloisa Feixas from Brazil. And they will be speaking about the role of higher music education in supporting and leading social changes in social proje projects. Welcome. Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? It's okay? The sound? Great, thanks. Thank for this opportunity. My colleague, Hejani, she's here, uh, but she's not feeling well. She has some health problems today, so I'm going to present both of for both of us, okay? Um, first of all, uh, I'd like to introduce a little bit of a background for this research, for this presentation. Um, actually, last year, we developed um, a research in two social projects in Belo Horizonte and Minas Gerais, the southeast of Brazil, where I live. Jani was here doing a postdoc with me. And then we, we carried out a research about leadership in these two social projects. And then from the results, from the findings from this research, we, we decided to carry on this year with some actions that came as kind of uh, motivation. We, we thought that we had to continue doing something about this work and involve the university more. So I'm going to present, can I share a, a little bit of a video um, quickly? Yeah. Thank you. We'll play it from here if that works for you. Hopefully you can see it. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Great. I was not sure about that. Yes. Thank you. It's just, a, um, it has nine minutes, but we can cut a little bit. I, I tell when to cut. Thank you. The University in the Communities, preparing undergraduate music students for engagement in social projects. Olá a todos e todas, eu sou Heloísa Feixas, professora da Escola de Música da UFMG e a minha companheira nesse trabalho de pesquisa é a professora Rejane Harder, da Universidade de Sergipe. Olá, meu nome é Rejane Harder e hoje vou apresentar a minha pesquisa já concluída de pós-doutorado pela Universidade Federal de Minas Gerais, cujo enfoque é a liderança musical engajada e o impacto social do fazer musical em dois projetos sociais de Belo Horizonte. In Brazil, as in other countries, music teacher training programs are often insufficient in preparing students for effective engagement in social projects. Curricula and respective teaching methods still are focused on the acquisition and development of music skills from European classical music. On the other hand, music educators who have experience with social projects are aware of the multifaceted needs of students' education for acting in this space, which involves artistic, musical, physical, social, psychological, and other dimensions. Therefore, it becomes imperative to integrate this theme into the curriculum of undergraduate music courses. This work presents outreach programs from two Brazilian federal universities aiming to bridge the gap between the university and local communities. 
Both programs have the main goal of providing to music students different experiences and social projects, breaking the walls of the university campus and opening to new scenes of our multifaceted, unbalanced and unequal society. The programs include training of students in creating collaborative learning, as well as skills in leadership. They encourage a decolonial and humanist perspective of teaching learning, considering students' previous knowledge and music experience, as well as the inclusion of a diversity of music, particularly Brazilian popular music. Such initiatives enrich and deepen music students' knowledge about different realities of our contemporary society, as well as develop their abilities to reflect on pedagogical and musical practices in social projects, inspiring them to keep searching for possible social transformations. The respect for human rights, the search for the integral development of the students are important actions that lead to individual and social changes. Contribute to the education of music students to enable them with skills to work in the third sector, providing them an expansion of the pedagogical musical learning, deepening their knowledge to work in a variety of contexts. Furthermore, it seems an urgent task since the current Brazilian higher music education does not address in depth the issues of education in the third sector, which is so important in our Brazilian society. The research carried out previously had the support of an outreach project called Creative and Collaborative Practice in the Kerubin Social Project with undergraduate and postgraduate students. From this project, several ideas came up to expand our activities in other social projects in both universities, which will be examined in the next section. Projeto Conectar, Music School of Federal University of Minas Gerais. In Brazilian society, it's quite common to have musicians becoming music teachers even without proper teaching training. Also, the reality of the labor market for a great portion of musicians involves working with popular music and in context of social projects. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, well, I think it's a kind of uh, overview of the two projects. We have, um, from there, we developed two big things, I think, for, for our reality here. This Projeto Conectar, was, I was just starting to talk on the video, is one of the results from this project, this research project. And then it actually, we had a, a seminar in April here in Belo Horizonte with a colleague from London, from Guildhall School of Music that came here and delivered a kind of workshop with 40 music teachers, social leaders about creating collaborative learning. And from this action, which was very impactful, we decided to continue with expanding this network. And now we are me meeting regularly. Every month we have a meeting with all the social uh, leaders and music teachers to continue developing skills in music in, in terms of collaborative and creative uh, learning. And this was very clear from our research when we interviewed students and um, po postgraduate students, undergraduate students that are working in social projects. They revealed to us that they don't feel comfortable and confident about their skills, the skills they have from the university to deal with this kind of reality. The reality in social projects is completely different from the reality they face in public schools or in private schools or even in teaching music privately. So they face so much problems in terms of social um, challenges and they said that they don't feel comfortable to deal with that. So I decided to create this network here to kind of create a lifelong learning project that then we can provide them at least some beginning for developing skills, not only musical skills, but also social and emotional human skills in terms of a humanistic view of education. And then in Sergipe, where Rejani lives in another university in the Northeast of Brazil, she also got inspired in creating an outreach program trying to connect the students from the university and the communities, the local communities. And then she's created a course also to, to provide the students opportunity to develop the skills. So we are trying to bridge this gap between the university and the communities, which is, is very, very big. And then these actions, um, we, we are trying to develop this and next year we 
we want to keep going with these ideas and then keep going with the research to evaluate, to assess the process, to assess the results and to check all the needs and the, the things that we can improve. So it's uh, it's very nice to see a small piece of research, a research project that is now unfolding in new possibilities and new actions. So this is our work at, at the moment. And um, we hope that next year we carry on with this. So I think it's it's okay for now and we are open for questions. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Um, so it's now time for um, questions from, from the group. Um, so if we could turn, thank you very much. But before we do, I, I have a little question, um, just from our context, um, if um, either, well, probably Eric, if you, if you could just, for the Australian audience, uh, who might not be aware of exact, exactly what a teaching artist is and why there is a need for teaching artists in your context, please. Uh, sure, there is no finite definition everyone agrees on for what a teaching artist is, but in general, it is an artist who has expanded their skill set to engage directly with participants and perhaps the clearest distinction is that the number one job of a teaching artist is to activate the artistry of others and then guide that artistry toward any number of learning ends from uh, improvements in academic achievement in schools all the way to social impacts such as changing beliefs and actions around the climate. So teaching artists, I say, are masters of the verbs of art. They are dedicated to expanding what an artist does to include direct participation with participants. And I have found out in uh, leading ITAC uh, that teaching artistry has arisen from the grassroots in every country in the world. There are tens of thousands of practicing teaching artists, often quite invisible, uh, I know in Australia, it's quite an active workforce uh, working on social good projects all over the country. And we estimate there's somewhere between 70 and 100,000 professional teaching artists in the world. Thank you. So um, the um, engagement with teaching artists that we saw in Brian's work was with children and universities. Can you talk just a little bit about that, Brian? Sure, absolutely. About the engagement, the, yeah. sorry, specifically about um, how they how they worked specifically in those kind of contexts. Yeah, absolutely. So this was in a in a university context, uh, uh, in young people coming in from the community from different. Um, community settings, schools, and, and um, a community nonprofit organization. So um, the way that the teaching artists work in that setting um, was very much collaboratively. Um, I think I mentioned in my uh, uh, presentation that the process was um, very much at, as a facilitator. Um, so helping young people uh, communicate together, make choices, um, think through different decisions that they might want to make, um, and also reflect together. So I think th that resonates a little bit with what Eric said about uh, some of the things that teaching artists do. Thanks very much. I'd like to move to the floor. I'm sure that there are plenty of um, questions. Here's one. Thanks. Hello, this is a question for Heloisa. Um, I'm just interested in terms of your students going out into community, could you provide some examples of the types of things they feel ill-prepared for or challenges that they face, like specific examples? What are, what are the kinds of things that they feel they're not prepared to deal with? Yes, of course. Um, the School of Music is very much based on European music, classical music. So even with some popular, Brazilian popular music, it's very 
elitist. And then when they go to the favelas, the slums, you know, the social projects, they face a total different reality in terms of cultural background, in terms of music. So first of all, is a shock in terms of music. They train; they are trained in classical music, and then they go to this people, these communities, and they have to face Brazilian Afro percussion uh, tradition, funk, hip hop, you know, all sorts of genres and popular music. So this is the first challenge. They are not prepared to face. There is a, there is a huge, huge gap between the cultural, you know, background. So this is one. And the second, just to make something short, is the this challenge of, of dealing with children that come from families totally unstructured the parents many many cases you see parents that are in jail they got in prison you know because they deal with traffic uh, of drugs or the mother that have to work all day cleaning places to put bread on the table you know all this inequality all this social difference is such a big thing here in brazil so in universities like a bubble so we have to face all the cultural background and the social difference that has to do with the racism also in Brazil, because this black communities is amazing. And it's big in these favelas, it is slums. And so the most, uh, in the social projects, most of the people, they are black. They come from the black origin here, the black people. So all these slaves things in the background, you know, so, so this is kind of huge problem to face. Okay, any other questions? Yes. Uh, thank you for the um, great sharings. Um, I'm interested, I guess, in relation to coming back to the university sector, all these understandings of these differences, how you bring that understanding back to the people who teach music. So that's a question for um, probably Brian or Heloisa, or both. <laughs> I can I can share a little bit. Um, uh, I know at the university where this project happened that there were uh, students studying uh, music education who were um, assisting. Uh, throughout th this process. So they were uh, fully embedded within that full day uh, festival and kind of experiencing um, all these interactions of teaching artists and young people and kind of seeing the process firsthand. Um, so so um, I, I can speak to that. Um, in terms of uh, my own work, so I, I help oversee a music ed ed area um, at a higher ed institution um, and actually run one of the ensembles here. So we're actually actively doing uh, this work in, um, in our, in our on ensembles. So students are actually participating um, in creative composition um, in different ways and, and having different kinds of experiences and kind of connecting back, I, I think, with um, what Eric described, um, oftentimes what that looks like um, is not only engaging in um, the creative process, but also connecting to some kind of social issue in the world. Um, like uh, j just very recently, um, uh, there was a, a partnership we had with um, local aquarium uh, here in the area and um, looked at the issue of um, plastic as it impacts marine life, as well as then obviously l later on human um, humans as well. Um, and students created a whole piece in response to that, that series of issues. So um, I think also in addition to the actual process itself, but looking to make those kind of connections um, and social impact in other formats. Um, hi, uh, I'm a student here at the Griffith University as a postgrad in community music education. This is not a question, but I 
would like to just comment my experience in the university where I, I, I'm, I'm on study leave. I think it's a curricular problem that our curriculum in the higher education should at least consider a service-based pedagogy in performance and in music teaching. Like it has to be already embedded in the curriculum. So then involvement in social projects should already be um, within all the, for example, the practicum classes, the performances should involve a greater, you know, a wider society and not just people who understand classical music, for example. Um, Heloisa, would you like to um, also comment on the pre previous question as well? So we've got, um, that was a, a lovely comment, thanks so much. But we've just, um, I wondered if you wanted to comment on that previous question as well. Yes, sorry. Just uh, quickly, what was the question? Do you want to restate it? Or shall I? Yep. Oh, yeah, I was just interested in relation to the understanding of the difference between the university sector and the social world and how do you teach that difference to the teachers that are working in the university to the students? Trying to figure that how, giving some examples about that how you are bridging those gaps in terms of the perceptions. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, w one of the pillars for us here in Brazil, in the in all the federal universities, we have the possibility of creating this bridge um, through outreach programs. We we are supposed to create outreach programs always. It's part of our work. And then I've been in all my life working in the university. I, I'm kind of outreach programmer that I always try to create this. And then now this is more than necessary because the curriculum, it doesn't uh, make this role to create the bridge, you know, to, to really put the students in, in touch with the reality. So the outreach programs is one way out, is the one possibility in creating this, you know, bridging this gap and, and piercing this bubble, you know, breaking the bubble and bringing the students, because once we have a program like this, the students go to the projects and they are kind of uh, monitors. They start as a monitor and then they get involved and then gradually they step in and then they go and have different roles and they learn many things. And some of them, they create a link with this project. And when they finish the undergraduate course, they become a professional there. They are invited to, to, to work there, to be employed. So it's a bridge, it's a way, a natural way that we at least we are trying to create these possibilities of um, involving more the communities with the students in the university. This is an example that I can give. Thank you very much. Have you got a question? Yes. <laughs> I have the mic, so I'm going to ask a question <laughs> and I'm going to stand on stage here so that the camera can pick me up. Hi, I'm Bridie. I think you all know that by now. And hi to our online participants. Um, and thank you to all of the presenters and to Julie for navigating such an interesting discussion so far. It seems to have been a really big thread so far at this sim in terms of how best to train socially engaged musicians. And there was such an interesting conversation about this yesterday. And I'm looking at Joe in particular, who's on screen in the middle of the night there. When someone posed the question, does this sim training belong in conservatoires? And Joe said that's a really dangerous question to ask because if it's not here, then what do conservatoires become? Do we give them permission to continue to become bastions of all the things we know we don't want them to be? And so um, in the pub last night, there was a great discussion about um, what that training might look like in conservatoires. But Eric, I was really inspired by your talk about the Firebird Fellowship, and I just started to have this vision of it not being an either or or one place, but this really interesting ecology of different options for training our sim field. And hearing about the community university partnerships that we've been hearing about in Brazil and the sort of more service 
this learning approach Sherla picked up just in that last question from the Philippines, how that can then also work in partnership with other conservatoire models, as well as the fellowship scheme that you've been talking about. Eric, I see a really interesting ecology and I can't imagine it really any other way for really being able to equip musicians for the work that we want to do. So I'd love to throw to, you know, people who have so much experience in this, like Eric, um, we also have Joe online, Andre as well, who has done so much work in this space. And Lucas, I think you do deserve to say something because it's the middle of the night and you, I'm sure, might like to contribute towards this. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on this ecology rather than an either or one model. Yes, do you hear me? Yes, exactly. Are you, are you hearing me? Yes. Yes. So um, uh, I wanted to ask. Um, well, uh, first of all, I'm sorry to, to not have been a part of these discussions in the bar uh, last night. But uh, what um, my question or my comment is very much in line with what uh, Bridie just uh, tells us. Um, I think, uh, Eric, that uh, the initiative that that uh, that is being taken by. Uh, aim is so interesting and my question is how can people become um, firebird fellowships that's that's one a question and the second is uh, more a comment uh, in the line of of Bridie's is I think that uh, it would be really interesting and important that such initiatives um, accompanying um, teachers artists teachers uh, musicians and social workers who want to become active or are active in this field can be accompanied and uh, to, uh, be prepared and that these initiatives uh, know each other and uh, can somehow maybe collaborate with each other and, and, and learn from each other's uh, good and not so good experiences. Uh, well, I can give answers to both your questions. The first is that the application for the Firebird Fellowship is not wide open. We uh, partner with organizations that have a faculty, uh, Music for Social Change programs, because we, we spend quite a lot of time curating the relationship with the host organization, with the partner organization, because we find that individual teaching artists even when inspired to change their practice, if they are not supported in practices of change, they run up against so many hurdles in the intensity of their practice demands that it's really hard for them on their own to really get better. So we work closely with the container institution to make sure they have the features that will support the teaching artists to do this work. And as you were suggesting, we actually are doing a lot of our work is remedial. These students who've come out of conservatoires are so tunnel visioned and so narrow in their understandings, their assumptions about teaching and learning and what the goals of practice are, that we do a whole lot of unlearning along the way toward the learning. We have found that it's essential that they be in a team. Usually we have what we call a Firebird Action Research Laboratory, a FAR lab in each program, which is five fellows who not only are undertaking their own action research experimentation, but meet together on a frequent basis to share what they're learning, what they're trying, and inculcating those habits of mind. Uh, in response to Bridie's other question, uh, I, I'll include a, a link to a curriculum I developed at Juilliard, where I was charged to uh, launch a teaching artist program for graduate students in music. So the idea was, how do you take students who are, you know, they're at Juilliard, they're, they're like the center of the tunnel universe, you know, they are burrowing into the narrow track. And at the same time, we had a two year program for those who were interested, an elective program in actually how to open up their work in social impact as a teaching artist. Uh, inter uh, interestingly enough, we found that the students who have gone through that program, number one, they tend not to go into orchestral careers. They tend to go into places where they have more 
artistic control, chamber groups and multi-faceted kinds of careers. And this is the big one. They actually earn more money than the students who have taken the conservatory tunnel track. The multiplicity of a teaching artist career provides many more avenues for career impact and expression in all different areas of social impact that turns into more creative and more lucrative careers. Sorry, I just, uh, hi, this is Tuyoti Rakina. Hi, Andre, hi, um, Joe, it's lovely to see you all on screen. Um, I just wanted to mention something. Eric, thank you for mentioning the um, teaching artists. Uh, it is a fairly new term down here. I think a lot of people will not know it. Um, but I'm going to do a shameless plug here. Um, I'm on the Center for Arts for Social Transformation at the University of Auckland with Peter O'Connor. We're hosting ITAC next year in Aotearoa, New Zealand. We would love musicians there because, of course, it's across disciplines and there's a, uh, Peter is in theatre, so it will be occupied by theatre people, I imagine, and um, dance. Uh, so we would love musicians to come and it's so close to Australia. It's in September and... Yeah, it's a very interesting space. And I think there's a lot of people here that would love it. So come on over, come on over, come on over. Thank you. I think, Eric, did you come and speak in Brisbane in about 2012 at, at a conference? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, we, I thought so, I on this topic, right? ITAC 2, <laughs> the second international teaching artist conference, was in Brisbane. That's right. Great shout out there for Brisbane. Um, <laughs> just a question. And it's up. <laughs> just a question, I guess, for everyone, including the other people who've presented today, and I think that this, looking at the Zoom room, um, particularly there, keep hearing about this outreach, getting out. Um, when's the in reach? <laughs> going to be the conversation, like, yes, uh, an, another violinist goes out to change their practice and save someone else's life, as opposed to the system having space for, I think about the Brazilian example, um, for those musical expressions from the favela to be in the conservatoire or not the conservatoire, um, following that discussion. So thoughts from that space is because I don't know, I get a bit tired of the outreach. Um, I just want to get to the in-reach. Okay, does anyone want to comment on that up there? Um, anyone? Eloisa? Um, or Joe? 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 I'll leave it to the panellists. <laughs> um, I'll throw in a quick two cents. Okay, great. That I find the in-reach is uh, is more difficult the more advanced in the traditional musical conservatoire system a young person goes. That students in community colleges, students in less high profile uh, conservatoires are actually internalized a much wider view of what a life of musical contribution can be. It's actually the pressures of the, the, the industry, you know, the classical music industry that starts to squeeze that expansiveness out of the musicians. Uh, so the, the further they go into the system, the less of that in-reach quality you're asking about is present. When I'm working in sort of less prestigious settings, I find uh, students are are full of understanding. And in countries outside Western countries, there's almost no division between being a musician and being a community engaged musician. Thank you. Um, I, 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 oh, sorry. sorry. Oh. <laughs> Could I just add, oh, everybody, you go ahead first. I just would like to tell one thing that happened here in Brazil, in, in my place, my university, few times, it was a knee rich uh, example. We have this uh, communities, black communities uh, that has tradition in African music connected to religious also context. 
And also we have indigenous tribes here in my state. Still we have indigenous from the north of Brazil that come down, you know. So we have all these. And then some lectures in a few years ago, they managed to bring the communities inside the university. And they were the, the protagonist of the, the lectures. They were giving the lectures, the, also the black and the indigenous. So it was a kind of a special moment. It was like optional course because the curriculum was not <laughs> prepared for that, but it was a beginning of a, it's an example of inbridge, you know, bringing them to our space and making these connections. It was really amazing to see this, just an example. Thank you very much. I see that um, a lot of the stuff, I mean, when I, when I look at this, oh, there's someone, someone wants to speak. Brian, I'm sorry, Brian. I'm not oh, doing no. a great job of this, honestly. <laughs> can, well, I'll just jump in very quickly. Um, and just to this idea of in, re, in reaching, um, for, for me, I think creativity and putting that in the center of the focus actually really opens up a lot of different possibilities. And, and that's one of the reasons I've really been um, studying this area and also exploring it in my own practice a lot more because it does allow for an entry point of any music. We don't have to live just in the world of classical or jazz or a specific uh, indigenous music or any one kind of music. We can all bring our unique um, interests and knowledge and background musically and otherwise to the process and work together and create something together uh hopefully with all of those things helping inform and shape what we make so i think that that looking for opportunities to center creativity and the creative process in um in this work in higher ed is maybe one path forward for the in reach Thank you. That's a lovely place for us to pause and stop. Um, thank you so much for your time. Um, it occurs to me that a lot of what we're talking about is the way that these musicians and these community musicians are thinking about themselves, their dispositions, how open-minded they are, Thomas, you know, in terms of the way that um, we, we foster that through any sort of training that we're doing, whether it be teaching artistry or whether it be in the teacher education space or whether it be in the conservatoire where, where we're trying to um, get students to think increasingly openly about their role and their careers and um, what the role of music is in, in that. And so I see some huge synergies between all of the papers today. Thank you so much. I see a desire to expand participation in music, a desire to expand the notion of what music might be and also what music education might be in the future. And I'd like to really thank you guys very much for your contributions. And I'm sure that the conversations will continue as we go forward. But we do, we are moving on to the next session. So before we go, please thank the speakers today.